Buonasera e benvenuti al dodicesimo appuntamento con Rinnovare la città, osservatorio sull'emergenza coronavirus promosso da Fondazione per l'innovazione urbana. Qui con me c'è la mia collega Valeria Vardi che per la Fondazione coordina i progetti europei e di sostenibilità. Questa sera abbiamo l'occasione di aggiungere un tassello importante alla riflessione trasversale che ha eh, accompagnato questo ciclo di dialoghi pubblici perché parleremo della relazione tra la pandemia in corso e la tutela delle risorse ecologiche. Per farlo abbiamo l'onore di avere qui con noi David Comen. Eh, come sempre nella seconda parte di questo, di questo dialogo, di questa conversazione, sarà possibile fare delle domande direttamente al nostro ospite. E con questo passo all'inglese. Good evening, Mr. Comen. It's a great pleasure for us to have you here and thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm very happy to be with you, Chiara. Thank you for welcoming me. Okay, so uh, thank you, Chiara, for your introduction. And uh, David Komen is an award-winning science, nature, and travel writer. He is a contributor editor at National Geographic and the author of a numerous book like Tangle Tree, which will be soon released, published uh, in its Italian version by Adelphi, and of course, a Spillover. Uh, in fact, eight years ago, in his book Spillover, he wrote about the uh, inevitability that uh, a future pandemic uh, would be caused by a zoonotic virus uh, uh, coming from a wild animal and that uh, humans will probably come into contact with this animal uh, in a wet market in China. However, as he already said, uh, he is not a Cassandra or a prophet. Uh, but he just studied the scientific data and uh, he followed scientists and researchers on, the, on their expedition in remote areas of the world and listened to them when he asked uh, questions like uh, where did the virus live when it's not busy killing people or uh, how did it pass from an animal into its first human victim? Do we as a humans have a role on the rise and spread of zoonosis? And uh, the answer uh, comes from ecology and evolution. So thank you, Mr. Common, for being here. It's really a pleasure for, for me and for uh, us to have you here. Grazie mille, Valeria. Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you. I think about Italy every day. <laughs> thank you. We, we would like actually to start from a broader question in order to provide a frame to our discussion, especially for those who may not be completely familiar with your work. So if we look at the current situation, uh, one could argue that human history is full of pandemic outbreaks and that they are somehow part of the game. And uh, as tough as it is, we must accept this. For instance, we had the bubonic plague or the Spanish flu, just an name two. So, is there a difference between COVID-19 pandemic and the ones we have been facing in the past? If so, why and how do they differentiate? And is it only, only a matter of uh, globalization? Right, well, they, we certainly have been subject to spillovers of viruses and also um, dangerous bacteria from wild animals into humans for as long as we've been humans, for 200,000 years. Um, and, and some of those spillovers uh, are famous to us. Um, the, uh, the bubonic plagues of the 14th century, um, which may have killed one third of the people living in the cities of, it, uh, well, of, of Italy, France, of Europe generally in the 14th century. Um, there have been other spillovers. You mentioned the 1918 influenza pandemic that uh, that probably began with a virus spilling over from uh, a wild aquatic bird into uh, domestic poultry or into um, a pig. And it may even have begun in the U.S., in Kansas, but it's very hard to know. The spillovers of influenza always come ultimately from wild aquatic birds. Okay. Um, so these have been happening in the past, but they've been happening more frequently in, in recent decades, say in the last 60 years. I usually um, chart the, 
the progress from 1961 when there was a spillover of a virus that came to be called Machupo from rodents in Bolivia, causing mm. a strange, terrible Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. Machupo 1961, Marburg 1967, Ebola 1976, uh, AIDS, HIV, recognized in about 1981, hantavirus in the U.S. 1993, hendrovirus, Australia 1994, et cetera, et cetera, SARS 2003 coming out of China, MERS. So there's been this whole sequence. What, what has been happening that's different from the past? Well, we humans are still coming in contact with uh, wild animals, particularly as we disrupt diverse uh, tropical ecosystems. Uh, that's what brings humans into contact with wild animals. And when we come in contact with wild animals, we come in contact with their viruses. What's different now? Well, we have 7.7 .7 billion, billion humans on the planet now. At the time of the 1918 influenza, um, there was only about 2 billion. So we have almost quadrupled our population just since 1918. So there are more humans coming in contact with more wild animals for more chances of spillover, the virus getting into one person or just a few people. And then if it transmits, there's more chance of it transmitting from one person to another because we live in dense cities, we're very interconnected. And then you mentioned globalization, Kiar. Yes, globalization is certainly a part of it. Um, globalization of our economies, globalization of travel has meant globalization of diseases, particularly viruses also. So when a virus gets into a city, uh, it can pass from one human to another and eventually it gets to the airport. Just the way SARS, the first SARS got to the Hong Kong airport in, in 2003 and went from Hong Kong to Toronto, from Hong Kong to Beijing, from mm -hmm. Hong Kong to Singapore in just a matter of hours, SARS. What's different this time? This is the trickiest, most subtle, most dangerous virus that we've faced in a very long time um, because it spreads very readily from human to human. Um, it has a fairly high case fatality rate and most importantly, it spreads from asymptomatic cases. It spreads from people who feel fine, who are walking around, who show no symptoms, and yet not only are they carrying the virus, but they're releasing the virus, shedding the virus. So that we now know this virus spreads not just on a cough, not just on a sneeze, but on a breath or on a spoken word. That makes it extraordinarily dangerous because it's gotten quickly everywhere, virtually everywhere around the world. And now um, in, the, in the places that have been hardest hit, it is making many, many people sick and killing a lot of people. And, and Italy, Northern Italy particularly, has been um, especially unfortunate with this virus and, and New York City also and a few other places. So this is new. This is a new virus for the 21st century, the most dangerous virus we have faced in at least 100 years, but possibly longer than that. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Mr. Coleman, as many have noticed, the coronavirus has pushed the climate crisis off the front pages. But that doesn't mean that the problem has vanished, of course. Yeah. And uh, on a recent article published on the correspondence, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has been described as climate change in a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the interesting thing is that, uh, according to the journalist, there are quite few similarities between the actual pandemic and the climate crisis. And there is also a lot we can learn from that. Uh, first of all, both the problems are mostly invisible. For example, we, as normal people, we cannot see uh, ocean acidification. We don't have a real perception of the problem. And that's exactly what makes them so dangerous. Mm -hmm. The second similarity is that both the coronavirus and the climate change affect everyone, but they also discriminate because they eat in particular, fragile people uh, in a hardest way. Finally, both the solutions um, demand for, uh, for response or answers on a global scale. 
I think that uh, having witnessed uh, the pandemic will make us all think differently about our ability to tackle uh, climate change. And uh, if you think so, do you have any... Well, I hope so. I hope that this will make it possible um, for us to um, begin taking drastic measures to deal with our biggest problems. And I think of, and I agree with all those similarities between the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, although I think there are also important differences. Um, and the most obvious difference is that um, the pandemic is a fast crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis that no one can ignore and no one can deny. Even Donald Trump, you know, <laughs> even Donald Trump cannot ignore this this crisis and people have continued to ignore the climate crisis so this this crisis is hitting us like that it's not a subtle crisis um, uh, but climate crisis is is at least as serious as this crisis it's just um, it's just um, a slow motion crisis mm -hmm. that will come to a critical point and then suddenly everything will get worse fairly quickly but in the meantime you know Glaciers are melting and uh, polar bears are drowning and ice is um, um, being lost in the in the polar regions and we have changes and we have all these things, but still um, ignorant, stubborn or or misguided people are able to ignore it and to deny it. I want to be careful with the adjectives that I use about the people I disagree with, even um, the, the fellow who is our president. <laughs> but it's not easy. Um, but um, so this is a, this is a sudden crisis, impossible to ignore. Um, the other thing I'd say is that um, among the things that this crisis and climate change do have in common uh, is the ultimate cause. I mm -hmm. think of it as we have three we have three huge crises on this planet, and that is climate change. And right now, this pandemic, but over the longer term, the threat of pandemic disease and loss of biological diversity, those three, loss of biological diversity, threat of pandemic and climate change. And some people have asked me, well, isn't this pandemic caused by climate change? And I would say, no, this is this pandemic is caused by a number of, of actions and mistakes, uh, but not directly by climate change. But it has the same ultimate cause. And that is the size of the human population, uh, the rate of consumption by humans, the choices that we make. We humans are eating this planet alive in a way that's not sustainable. So um, climate change and pandemic threat and loss of biological diversity, I think of them as three great raging rivers of trouble running parallel um, and they're all draining off the same mountain. They're draining, draining off the same snow fields on one great mountain. And we are doing things that are melting those snow fields and creating these three parallel torrential rivers of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that this drastic crisis, um, because it can't be ignored and because it is causing so not just so much human suffering but so much not just so much uh, medical suffering but also so much economic suffering and loss around the world i hope that this will turn out to be an opportunity for drastic change in the way we live on this planet um, the way we reproduce the rate at which we reproduce the way at rate at which we consume the rate at which we ignore um, regulations and possibilities of, of controlling our impacts. I hope that this will be an opportunity for drastic change. And if it's an opportunity for drastic change in the way we handle pandemic threats, maybe it will be an opportunity for drastic change in the way we deal with those other two crises too. Mm. That's what I hope. Okay, let's hope. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one more question from my side. Uh, one of the paragraphs I like the most on your book, Spillover, is the one where you argue that in those places where deforestation uh, is at its highest rate and where wild fauna is killed deliberately, local germs flow away like dust. 
Mm. Uh, hence, if we disturb a parasite or a virus uh, on its daily life, and we push it away from its original host, it only has two chances. The first one is finding a new home, and the second one is becoming extinct. Yeah. However, as Darwin uh, teaches us uh, on, uh, on his book, uh, The Origin of Species, uh, it's not the most intellectual um, of the species that survives, nor the strongest, but the one that is, is able to best adapt and uh, adjust to the changing environment. Right. Yeah. So, uh, does it stand uh, here the connection between human destruction of biodiversity and pandemics? Uh, and secondly, how human interference uh, with the environment creates the condition for new virus to spread? Right, right. You all ask good questions. Um, <laughs> they're, they're conversations in themselves. Yes. Um, this is, first of all, um, about viruses. Um, you're right that I have said, and others have said, that viruses are evolutionary beings. Whether you say they're alive or not alive, they have genomes, they use the same genetic code that we do. They follow the Darwinian imperative um, to reproduce themselves, uh -huh. to survive, to spread themselves through space and time. Viruses don't have wishes, they don't have purposes, they don't have goals, but the fact that they reproduce um, with variation in their populations and they compete with one another means that they are subject to natural selection. So it's always the survival of the fittest virus. Mm. Um, so if you have an endangered species, uh, say a rare monkey, mm -hmm. and it's going extinct because humans are destroying its habitat, which we are doing in many places. Mm -hmm. We're cutting down the trees, we're, you know, we're killing the wildlife for food, we're building villages and things. So you have an endangered monkey and this endangered monkey is carrying um, viruses, including one virus that has the potential to survive in a human. So uh, one person goes out and he catches a monkey and he kills it and he butchers it and he gets exposed to this virus Mm -hmm. And the virus follows the opportunity to infect the humans. Um, and it gets into that, say it's a man, it gets into that hunter, that man who has killed this virus. And it finds that it can replicate. That virus is happy. That virus is adapting to a new situation, a new kind of host. And then after it replicates in this man, it finds that it can transmit mm -hmm. on blood, um, or sexually, or on a sneeze or a cough, uh, to a woman, and then another man, and then another child, and a and a woman, and suddenly it's it's passing through an entire family. It's passing through a village. The virus is now happier. It's succeeding in Darwinian terms. If one person goes to a town, the virus is passed to people in the town. It goes to the people in a city. It gets on an airport. It rides to another part of the world. It starts spreading. This virus is now becoming much, much more successful. So by going from an endangered monkey that's on its way down into its first human host, this virus has seized the greatest opportunity that any virus could wish for. Mm -hmm. The possibility of getting into humans and spreading among humans. Now, instead of there being uh, 1,100 surviving um, individuals of its host species, this endangered monkey, instead of 1,100 in a little patch of forest, it has 7.7 .7 billion hosts that it can colonize. This virus is now a great Darwinian success. Yes. Uh, yep. And when and we bring that on, we give viruses the opportunity to jump into us. We're a big target and we represent great evolutionary success. We give them the opportunity by going into diverse ecosystems, by destroying those ecosystems, by coming in contact with the wild animals and offering ourselves as a new kind of host to the viruses that live in those wild animals. Okay, thanks, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. Common, before opening up uh, the question time eventually with the public, I would like to ask you another question. Um, at the very end of Spillover, you argue that we humans are inseparable from the natural world. 
and that the concept itself of natural world is artificial. But it seems to me that we tend to conceive our presence in the planet as strongly and intimately related to a continuous and often uh, destructive uh, anthropocentric growth. As if uh, the Earth is something that we own, uh, that we need to conquer, that we need to control. So first of all, do you agree with this? It's a long question, sorry. So do you agree with this? Uh, and if so, do you think that this tendency we have towards continuous growth is related to our contemporary society, to Western society, or do you think it's linked to the very essence of our uh, being a hum human being? And also, I would like to ask you if in your travels you have met many, may maybe any community or any species that could, could inspire us toward this paradigm shift and uh, that we can learn from uh, about how to live with other beings in a world that is not our own. And the very last question, but it's all related, mm -hmm. is that at the same time, it seems to me that there is a growing attention to science and popular science. Uh, do you think that it is because we kind of finally are becoming more aware of the big challenges ahead? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kiara. Uh, I'll try and uh, I'll try and touch on all that, but you might have to remind me of some points in this question. First of all, do I agree with the the um, with the premise that? Um, we humans, although we are part of nature, we would prefer to think of ourselves as separate from nature and above nature, and that the entire world belongs to us for our use. As, as certain scriptures, certain religious scriptures say, including um, the Bible. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. We do want to believe that we are not part of the natural world, that we are separate from it, that it exists for our use. And we should be allowed to do anything that we want that makes humans more comfortable, more healthy, better fed, uh, more amused uh, at the expense of the natural world. Yes, I agree. That is our tendency. Does that tendency, is that tendency unique to us? Is it unique to Western uh, capitalistic industrial society? No, I don't think it's unique to us. Um, I think that that instinct is in humans all over the world. And I think it's also in other animals. I think that that instinct is Darwinian to take as much as you can from your environment and replicate yourselves as many times as you can. But we are unique. And I'm saying things that I'm sure are, are obvious, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to connect your question. You're thinking on this with, with the things that I know about evolution and about disease. I think that we are unique because I think that the impact of, um, of any species, but particularly the human species, the total ecological impact is a matter of um, the population number um, multiplied by technology, and we're really the only species that have technology, um, multiplied by consumption. How much we consume, how many of us there are, how much we consume, and whether technology increases or decreases our impact. Um, so we're, we're this big brained ape that's been around for 200,000 years and for the last 10,000 years we've had agriculture and we have language and for the last 200 years we've had fancy technology of all sorts and, and fossil fuel, burning of fossil fuel and other amazing inventions, all of which um, have increased the, um, the opportunity for us to consume. Um, this is probably obvious too, but some people say, well, it's population, it's all population and people in Africa with eight kids should not be having eight kids. But if a family in a village in Africa who has eight kids, um, part of the reason they're doing that is because they haven't had the opportunity for education. They haven't had the opportunity for pop, uh, birth control. They haven't had the opportunity for food security and um, health care so that they know that however many kids they have, those kids will survive. So there is a tendency to have eight kids because you don't know how many are going to live. Mm -hmm. uh, and those eight kids, those, those 
those children in that village, those eight children, are going to consume more, less in their lifetimes total than probably one child in the United States or in Italy. One middle class child in Italy or the United States will consume more than those eight kids, uh, perhaps. So that's the way to think about it. Population times consumption yields the impact. But then the technology also plays a role because technology can either increase or decrease the impact of consumption. For instance, when we invented chainsaws, we increased the rate at which we consume forests just by having chainsaws. Um, when we invented solar panels, we decreased the rate of our consumption of fossil fuels. So you multiply population times consumption and then the factor of technology either increases or decreases potentially your total impact. You think about all those things uh, when you think about how humans are, are destroying the natural world and the biological diversity on the planet. Um, so I don't know if I've touched on all of your questions. I probably haven't. Tell me which part I haven't. Uh, maybe the last, the very last part about uh, this growing interest towards science and uh, popular science that is maybe sign of a willing to be informed on our contemporary world and maybe that we are unprepared by our actual educational system. This is yes. just a guess, I don't know, and maybe that we look forward more and more information and way of comprehend this transition we have to face. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, science and technology, for technology for the reasons I just said, uh, and science which, which powers and inspires technology, um, are hugely important and um, they have huge potential for us to be, to be able to lessen, to mitigate our impact on the planet um, and to deal with crises, not just like climate change, but also like pandemics. Um, we need science and technology very badly now. And one of the reasons this, <clears throat> this pandemic has gotten out of control is because we had science and we had technology and political leaders ignored it, didn't listen to it. So that's a problem that we have. We need much more training of young people in science, including biology, but not just biology, not just evolutionary biology, um, disease ecology, uh, virology. We need more training and all that in the sort of technological engineering that's used to develop diagnostic tests from scientific information about a genome or whatever. We need much more of all of that. But we have this problem. It's a terrible problem. Um, and I'm not sure how we're going to deal with it. And that is the denial of science, not just a lack of science, but rejection of science that we have. Now, this is a problem, it's a terrible problem in my country. I gather it's a problem in Italy too. I gather that you have to some extent an anti-vaccine um, campaign, uh, people who are arguing against vaccines, people who are suspicious of science, people who are rejecting the science of vaccine development. Um, so how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with adults who are saying, we don't want your science. Don't talk to us about the science of this disease or the science of climate change. We don't like experts. Uh, we want to follow our intuition or we want to follow those political leaders, those demagogues who stand up and say, don't believe the science. That's, as Donald Trump said the other day, that's an unacceptable answer when Tony Fauci said, uh, we shouldn't open the schools in the US yet. That's an unacceptable answer. Why? Because he refuses to engage with the science. He doesn't like the conclusions. He is concerned about the economy because he wants to be reelected in November. He's got a very short-sighted views. Uh, how do we deal with that? When we have news organizations or news organizations that propound these, um, these false narratives and they have stolen the term fake news so they're calling real news fake news and meanwhile they're producing fake news um, and and science is being um, science is being constrained because money is being taken out of scientific uh, institutions uh, including the ones who should be dealing with this pandemic and um, and people adults are, are going along with this idea saying oh we don't like what science says so we're going to say that science is not important or science is false we'll have our own science science 
It's a terrible problem. And, and Kiara, would you please tell me how we're going to solve it? <laughs> I leave the answer to my colleague, Valeria. Thank Valeria, you. please, yeah. would you tell us? Yes, I, I just need like a couple of minutes to focus on your question. Then I'm sure I will give you a very perfect okay. answer. All right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, we opened the, the question to the public. So we have the very first question for you. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, from Daniel, Daniel Raimondini, uh, who is asking, all countries are potential targets of pandemics, but not all those countries are equally potential sources. What is, to your knowledge, uh, WHO or international entities uh, doing for this? So what international organization uh, are doing to deal with, uh, with these pandemics and uh, all related problems? Well, Daniel, you're right that, um, that all, uh, all countries are subject to the dangers of pandemic and all countries are not equally likely to be the sources of pandemic because some countries have already eliminated most of their biological diversity. Mm. Uh, and that's a problem. Um, so there are countries that don't have much biological diversity. They don't have many wild animals um, and therefore they don't have as many viruses lurking in those wild animals. Mm. However, the people in those countries are consuming. Uh, and in some cases they're consuming at a rate higher than the people in the countries that still have the biological diversity and, and serve as sources, possible sources for um, new viruses. Um, for instance, the people in the Netherlands, and I know, love the Netherlands, um, don't have a great deal of biological diversity left. The people in the Democratic Republic of Congo have huge biological diversity um, and therefore quite a number of viruses, including Ebola virus. Um, but does that mean that Congo is the problem and um, it's a problem that the Netherlands shouldn't have? No, I don't think so. I think my friends in the Netherlands, uh, and I have been talking with them quite a bit in recent weeks too, I think they would agree that um, consumption around the world is, uh, is a globalized force that causes the greater likelihood of spillover in remote places where there is biological diversity, and therefore everyone shares um, some of the responsibility. For instance, if you have a cell phone, if you have a cell phone, then you are a customer for a mineral called coltan, C-O-L-T-A-N, necessary for making tantalum capacitors to use in your cell phone or in your laptop. Um, mm -hmm. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from just a few places where coltan is mined, including the Eastern Congo. Mm -hmm. And so by being a customer for a cell phone, you ask miners to go into this area where there is a lot of dense tropical forest and there are a lot of wild animals uh, lowland gorillas and a number of species of monkeys, number of species of bats. And you ask miners to go in there and get coltan for you. What are they going to eat while they're there? Uh, well, they're going to need protein. They're not going to just eat rice and manioc. And what protein is going to be available to them? Monkeys, rodents, bats, um, even gorillas. And so everyone has a share of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, international organizations working on this. Um, there are some very good ones, uh, including an organization based in New York, a private organization, a research organization called EcoHealth Alliance. And when I researched my book, Spillover, um, many of the people that I traveled with to the remote places to see the work of, of studying viruses in their animal reservoirs um, in Bangladesh, uh, when we were uh, trapping bats on a rooftop of an old warehouse in the middle of the night or in China when we were climbing into a cave looking for bats or in the Congo when we were um, trying to tranquilize dark gorillas to look for Ebola uh, antibodies, sign of Ebola. Um, the people that I was with are, are members of EcoHealth Alliance, in, at least in those three cases. It's a wonderful organization. They have just lost a $3.7 million grant because they worked cooperatively with a lab in China that oh. Donald Trump doesn't like. And so that $3.7 million grant was canceled. Very little of the money from that grant was going to this lab, a little bit. 
for their cooperative work. Um, so there's one organization that I think very highly of that's being punished for doing research on the dangers of um, viruses in bats that led to this very pandemic. It's, it's a case of trying to kill the, the messenger because you don't like the message. There are other organizations, but that's just one that I think very highly of. Thanks. Thank you. Another question from Umberto Mezzacapo. Urban regeneration has become a practice and a prerogative of territorial governance in many post-industrial countries in order to prevent soil consumption and uh, this way reaching a better balance between urbanization and rural areas. However, in many developing countries, uh, land continues to be subtracted through uh, urbanization itself, agriculture and grazing. Uh, quite often to feed just those above mentioned uh, past industrial countries. How can we avoid such externalities and ensure a necessary living space for ecosystems and in general for, for fauna and flora so that phenomena, phenomena such as spillover don't occur? Um, thank you for the question. That's a, um, a difficult question, but an important one. Um, and I'm not particularly qualified to answer it, but I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, I, I agree that um, much, of, uh, much of the resources um, that um, are drawn from the wild habitat that we're losing in remote parts of the country are drained away for the lifestyles of people in other places, that sort of externality. Um, uh, we are losing areas of um, of Central African forest, tropical forest all over the world, um, uh, savanna also, tundra in the Northern Hemisphere, um, forest in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia. We're losing those um, at, a, at a terrible rate um, and they are be, being converted into all the resources that I've been talking about that we consume. How do we deal with that? How do we slow that? I think that uh, the best way I can think think about it is there, there are, there are two ends uh, of that problem, of that, that flow of resources away from wild diverse ecosystems. And the, the, um, the people who live in those countries live at relatively low standards of living to other places where people have much higher standards of living. Uh, two ends of that. One is what's happening, um, turning tropical forest into agricultural land or into palm plantations, palm oil plantations, or into places where cattle are grazed, as in the Amazon, former forest being turned into cattle pasture so people in other parts of the world can have meat. That's one end of it, how those practices are organized, and at the other end of it is our demand. How much meat do we want? How much timber do we want? Um, so I think we have to think about those both ways. There are certainly ways to do agriculture better, more diversely, less disruptively. Uh, I think of the kind of work that is being done, for instance, in Mozambique mm -hmm. at Gorongosa National Park and at the buffer zone around Gorongosa National Park. It's a wonderful project that I've, that I've seen. And it's led by um, um, financially and organizationally by the Carr Foundation, mm -hmm. a fellow named Greg Carr, um, who made hundreds of million dollars with some um, some computer just, uh, inventions and has a very good heart, but also a very good head. He has um, put his uh, life into Gorongosa National Park, working with um, Mozambican partners who run the park. Um, he brings finance to it. They educate young girls in the villages surrounding the park so that the opportunity for young girls is expanded. They work with farmers to diversify their farming so they're not just farming corn and using chemicals, but they're farming, um, it's sort of multi-level farming. They're raising organic coffee on Mount Gorongosa. They're doing a number of things with two intentions. One, to the three intentions, to decrease the impact on the forests of this ecosystem in Gorongosa National Park and surrounding it to, to um, decrease the impact to improve the, um, the standard of living of the people who live around the park so that they are glad rather than resentful that this park is there and 
to to do this in a way that's sustainable that doesn't create simply more hungry mouths more people who need jobs um, and therefore inevitably more impact um, on the other end of this chain are those of us who sit in uh, developed countries in cities or in towns like where i sit and um, make the decisions the consumption decisions and that involves all the choices that we make um, the things that we buy um, what we eat how much meat we eat um, eating less meat less and less all the time more locally raised meat or no meat at all um, is certainly something that decreases our impact um, how many children we have if we choose to have children how much we travel burning fossil fuels if we travel and i travel a lot and i'm trying to think about how to travel less and this is this is one pretty good way um, this thing that we call zoom now um, so all of those decisions i think um, at the um, at the front end where the impacts occur lessening um, the way our development needs and our agriculture and our mining impact um, areas of you know natural habitat and and on the, the demand end um, and there are you know a million details that go into that that um, agricultural economists and conservation biologists um, and, um, and and globalization economists understand far better than I do but that's what I would think about thanks Mr. Foreman so uh, we have a third question from uh, Ruth Anau Santini who is asking uh, are you an advocate of pandemic re reparations uh, uh, the international community is asking to China and mm -hmm. uh, related to that how could wet markets uh, be banned in Asia and uh, if they will be uh, one day in the next future be banned wet market in China uh, would pandemics become um, less dangerous yeah okay um good questions i'll start with this with the, the, the last one um when people talk about wet markets in china um uh they think of wild animals carrying viruses and starting pandemics that spread around the world but a wet market um is a place that provides fresh food to people often in cities or in towns um and it's there it's in important in terms of their access to food, their food security, their access to, to, to healthy, fresh food, because a wet market uh, is likely to contain vegetables and fruits and also seafood, live and, and dead, um, um, domestic animals, live and dead, meat, poultry, um, pork, etc. And then also, in some cases, such as um, the, the, the famous case that we know about now in um, Wuhan, China, also wild animals, wild animals captured live from the wild and brought in cages to the wet mark. Also wild animals of some sorts raised in captivity under relatively hygienic conditions intending to clear them of infections by viruses and bacteria, such as the, the bamboo rats that I describe um, in my book when I visited a, a, a bamboo rat farm in mm -hmm. China. And I even had dinner and ate bamboo rat with the, the owner of that uh, farm. Um, so there's a variety of things. But what's most dangerous and what needs to be controlled or stopped is the capture of wild animals from the wild, bringing them live to markets. Yes, yes. I believe that we need to stop that. Um, should there be reparations? Should we be talking about China having to pay billions of dollars of pandemic reparations to the rest of the world because this pandemic began there. Well, it occurs to me that if we're going to do that, then perhaps we should talk about reparations for the 1918 influenza. And then we have to figure out where did it begin? Did it begin in the United States? Did it begin in Kansas? The scientific evidence is still a little bit uncertain. But if it began in Kansas, then doesn't the United States owe reparations to the world for the, for the great pandemic of 1918? It's complicated. Where did measles come from? Measles still kills 100,000 peop uh, people a year, a year. And measles has killed millions of people. Where did that come from originally? Which country is going to pay us reparations for measles? Where did bubonic plague come from originally? Did it come from the steppes of Asia, Mongolia? Are we going to ask Mongolia to pay reparations 
for bubonic plague in the 14th century? It's tricky. Mm -hmm. And once you start down that road of asking for reparations, the first thing you need to do is look in the mirror. It's a very dangerous chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hi. We have another question from Flavia Tomazzini. Uh, at the end of your book, Spillover, no, at the end of the chapter of Spillover dedicated to SARS, um, you recall of a flight you took back in the time when you were researching for the book. Mm -hmm. You were seated close to a Japanese couple. SARS was over, but they were wearing masks on the plane. Today is the very first day in Italy of the reopening of shops and bars and restaurants. This morning I went food shopping and people were back in the streets, in the squares, in the shops, wearing a mask and keeping the social distancing. So I wondered, what should we expect for the next one, two, three years? Is COVID-19 likely to strike back, to mutate? Are other coronaviruses likely to outbreak? Are we all going just to just include masks? and social distancing in our lives indefinitely. What do you think about this? All of your questions are so good and complicated. <laughs> I hope I'm not talking too long. Come, I'm back, trying to answer come back next Monday. Come back <laughs> each Monday for three months. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with this one, that's it. The part about the masks on the, on the plane, uh, the Japanese couple, I have thought about that again myself in recent weeks and months. So uh, who asked this question? Flavia Tommazzini. Flavia. Good question, Flavia. Um, and I've thought back to that Japanese couple, and I sort of dismissed them at that time. I saw them probably in 2009. I think that was when I was coming out of China. So that was 2009. SARS was over. They had visited uh, Guangdong province, and they were wearing masks on the plane. And I assumed that they were wearing masks to protect themselves from some virus that might be on that plane still. And therefore, I, don't, I, I didn't make fun of them, but I said, now, you know, this seems probably unnecessary and a little bit paranoid. Um, maybe they were wearing masks because they both had colds. If so, they were right and I was wrong because the, the main purpose of a mask is not to protect you from another person, but to protect another person from you. Particularly with this virus, do I advocate wearing masks in public places? Yes, I do. Am I doing that? Yes, although I'm not going into public places hardly at all. Uh, but I have a cloth mask. Um, when I went, to, I've only been in one building that is not my house for the last month and a half. Mm -hmm. And that was a hospital where I had to go in because I'm going to have knee surgery. And I wore a mask to go in there and everybody was wearing masks. So yes, it's, it's good to wear a mask now. If you go to the grocery store, wear a mask. Why? To protect yourself? No, to protect the other people. You don't know if you're sick or not. You don't know if you're a silent spreader. You might have contracted uh, COVID-19 and be feeling just fine, but spreading the virus. That's why you wear a mask for the other person. And it's a signal of our civility. It's a signal of caring about our community, caring about other people to wear a mask is to say to the people that you see, I might be infected, so I'm trying to protect you because we're all in this together. Uh, so is the virus gonna be around? Uh, I think so. I don't think we're gonna get this virus. Uh, we're gonna eradicate this virus. I think that this virus is gonna be around. I think that you know, your children and your grandchildren are probably gonna be vaccinated against this virus. I hope we will have a vaccine in the next couple of years. And then I think people will start to be vaccinated for this and they will always be vaccinated. Will this virus evolve? Once we have a vaccine, it may evolve to try and um, escape the vaccine, to get around the vaccine. Right now, the, the scientists who study the, the genetics of this virus, the ones that I'm following are saying, this virus is not evolving very quickly because it doesn't need to. It's so successful just as it is. Uh, when it becomes less successful, there will be more pressure on it to evolve and try something new. So. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we have a very last question from uh, Arianna Capirossi. 
that she's asking, do you think that new pandemics, uh, um, no, sorry, do Bolsonaro and this policy focus largely on deforestation of the Amazon rainforest yeah. uh, represent a threat, a threat also in relation to the triggering phenomenon uh, of new pandemics? Yes, and yes, yes. Perfect. <laughs> go, go, go finish, Valeria. No, 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 no. I was just heading okay. that. Uh, I get, for... Yeah, I get the question. I've been talking, uh, I've been talking with a number of Brazilians recently because um, my book is just being published in in Brazil and in Portugal, mm -hmm. um, and so we've been talking about President Bolsonaro yeah. and his policies of encouraging further development, deforestation of the Amazon. Um, does that represent a threat of um, of viral spillover? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there are so many different species of wild animals in the Amazon, uh, some of which haven't had much contact with humans yet. As, as people go into those forests, cut down the trees, um, take away the timber, maybe turn it into cattle pasture, they will be coming into contact with these animals. And Valeria, you mentioned, I think, earlier my, my analogy when I say somewhere in the book that, you know, if a tropical forest is like an old barn and you bulldoze it, viruses rise like dust from this demolished barn. That's a metaphor. It's not literally true. It's not that, you know, when you cut down a patch of the Amazon, viruses float up into the air. I mean, that's possible. But what happens is that people come in contact with the animals when they're deforesting. They, um, they kill the animals. They eat the animals. You know, they handle the animals. And the animals carry these viruses to get into humans. Does that happen in, in Brazil just as much as it happens in mm -hmm. other places with great tropical diversity? Yes. I think that there's a virus, Hunin virus, J-U-N-I-N. Uh, my recollection was a little bit vague, but I think that was a Brazilian Amazon um, virus. And there will, we can, we can be confident that there will be more. There will be others uh, coming out of the Amazon. Coming out of Central Africa, viruses like Marburg and Ebola, um, coming out of other places, um, even coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of the, um, the suburbs of uh, New England in the United States or, or coming out of uh, forested areas that remain in Italy. Yes. I can add something. This is a really shocking truth. Uh, if we think that, if I remember correct, uh, uh, in the last 30 years, we got down like 178 hectares of rainforest, uh, which is like a, a crazy number. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's yeah. really shocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it continues. 100 In the last 30, 178 million? Is that what you say? Yeah, yeah, if I remember correct, it's just the data I saw so, like on uh, on a report a few days yes. ago. Yeah, and it's hard to measure. It uh, it is hard to measure, but we know it's a um it's a it's a heartbreaking quantity each day uh -huh. and it's it's a catastrophic quantity each year. Yeah. Uh -huh. In places like you know, Borneo, other parts of Indonesia, the Amazon, um, Central Africa, the Congo, uh, um, the United States is still cutting down a lot of forests. Um, the Canadian Arctic, yep, yep, it's a, it's a heartbreaking problem. But um, we have to think of um, not just how we can blame people for doing that, but how we can reduce the demand for that. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that involves choices that we all make. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very interesting points, actually, this last year. Yeah. And uh, so for, uh, I think we don't have uh, other questions for, uh, from the public. So Chiara, if... Yes, thank you for your time. And thank you for You're answering welcome. all these very long questions. <laughs> it was really a pleasure for us. And... Uh, well, thank you very much, Valeria, Chiara. Thank you very much, grazie mille. Um, and uh, I, w I thank you for doing this in English. I thank you for you asking the questions in English. I thank people for listening in English. I, I wish that um, I had more than just the tiniest, tiniest bit of Italian. Um, I keep coming back to Italy. I'm looking forward to getting back to Italy soon. 
uh, for research on on this because I'm doing a book on COVID-19. So as soon as it's reasonable to travel, I, I hope to be back in um, in Italy um, because it's such a wonderful place. So thank you. Come visit us at the Foundation for Urban Innovation. It will be a pleasure to to also to give you some Italian lessons. So. Okay, that's a deal. That's a deal. All right, grazie mille. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.